And now I would like to introduce John Gersma, author of the very fabulous Athena Docu Doctrine, and really just a lovely man who yeah. knows his stuff, a consultant and marketer. Just fabulous. Got it. Thank you so much. I mean, you think about the accomplishments of these three amazing women. We're going to talk very briefly about what is happening societally at large that is starting to favor what we believe is an emerging feminine age. I'm um, going to kind of go through these pretty quickly so we can get into the panel. But um, as she mentioned, I wrote this book, um, co-authored this book with Michael D'Antonio called The Athena Doctrine. And what we looked at is we conduct research all over the world. Uh, we did research in 64,000 people in 13 countries. But the other thing that Michael and I did is we traveled all over the world. I think I had hair when I started this project. Um, but we went to 26 cities. We met amazing people. We saw startups, entrepreneurs. We met CEOs, all kinds of really amazing people. We talked to world political leaders. We actually even spent um, time with President of Israel, Shimon Peres. And he said something to me I'll never forget. He said, we're in a new world with many old minds. We're in a new world with many old minds. And he said, the task of a leader is to adapt yourself. And what he was talking about was this sort of rise of this social economy, globalization, this sort of interdependency that we all have today, and this desire and belief that leadership really hasn't caught up. So that's what this book is about, is really sort of the emergent rise of feminine values and leadership. And we saw it because we saw a lot of widespread disapproval around the world. 51% of people thought that life, um, questioned whether or not life would be better for their children rather than themselves. Picking up again what Jennifer was talking about, about this macro sort of pessimism that exists. Concern about power in corporations is a dominant um, concern around the world. Also the fact that this question of empathy in our leaders, do our, do our leaders actually care about us and our citizens? 76% of people disagree. And then they even question society's basic fairness. Over half the people really are concerned. Three quarters, they don't think things are really stacked up. And what we saw as we traveled and we saw in our data is that there was sort of this sort of global referendum on unfettered testosterone, right? Dissatisfaction with the conduct of men in my country. And what was really fascinating to us is this wasn't about men versus women. It was actually people, all of us just frustrated with the way things are, the way business is conducted, the way politics are conducted, and sort of the way societal norms are sort of stacked up. And so, you know, you saw it was really interesting, you know, um, in South Korea and in Japan, 80% of the men were frustrated with the conduct of men. Now, I should point out the Canadian men here must be doing something right, because they have the lowest levels. <laughs> Canada, let's go! Yet, as you look around the world, two-thirds of people think the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. So this dominant thing got us really interested, so we went as researchers, and we actually went out and conducted a survey. And what we did is we asked half our sample, 32,000 people, to take 125 human traits and just ask them to tell us what they thought, if they thought they were more masculine or feminine or, or neither. So that was half of our sample. But the other half of our sample, we asked them about leadership. We said, take these very same traits, this time no mention whatsoever of gender, tell us what would make for more effective leaders in today's society. What would make us happier as a culture? What would make us more successful? And what we did as researchers is we modeled this data and we started to see that what people around the world are looking for are more feminine qualities in our leadership, right? First of all, it was really interesting to me as a researcher, aggression, pride, and independence were the least correlated to the ideal modern leader. When in fact, what they're looking for is more expressiveness, more patience, more flexibility, more loyalty, more collaboration, and more passion. Now, it doesn't mean that you don't near, nearly also have to be resilient at times and be aggressive at times. That's clearly it goes with the territory. What people are saying is that we need leaders that are gonna be more nuanced to lead in this new era. And so what we did is we started to kind of devise and see that there were sort of these 10 tenets that were guiding the sort of new aged, what we call the Athena leader. And they were sort of skills that people were either building into their management teams or they were building into their own profiles in a, as a way to sort of thrive. And I'll look, talk about a, a really counterintuitive one really briefly. Let's talk about vulnerability as, as a leadership trait. So one of the guys that I met, I was in, um, in Berlin and I met this guy his name is Dr. Ayad Madish. Has anyone heard of ResearchGate, researchgate.org? Well, so he was a, a virologist, he is a virologist, he's got a PhD in virology, and he 
kept getting stuck in his experiments at Harvard. And he went and he asked for colleagues for help, and they said, you look ridiculous, you look foolish, you should have the answers. And he thought, this is a ridiculous idea, like I just am asking for help, I'm being vulnerable and open. And so what he did is he decided to go to Berlin, he created ResearchGate, which is the first social media, sort of Facebook for scientists. You guys, today he has 2.9 million scientists collaborating on 800,000 different research projects. And I asked him, I go, what do you want to do with this? He goes, I want to crowdsource a Nobel Prize. And I want the credits to flow like they would at the end of a movie. Right? But so the whole idea here is, you know what? Scientists, instead of being in a cubicle, let's work together. Let's be open about what we don't understand. And let's find ways to collaborate to really further progress. We also met the highest ranking woman in the Israeli Defense Force. She's actually the highest ranking military uh, woman on the planet. Her name is Major General Orna Barbavai. And I asked her how she approached military strategy, and she said, as a mother. She talked about mothers having this acute sense of the ability to sort of game out multiple scenarios and anticipate conflict before it happens. So one of the things she did is she brought women for the first time to the checkpoints in Syria and Gaza Strip, and she also awarded soldiers for de-escalating conflict. These types of strategies we sort of saw all over the world. We saw in Again, in Berlin, Leo Riski is a cultural attache of the Felisus. Felisus is Danish for house for everyone. This is the first shared embassy in the world. It's the home to the five Nordic nations of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, and Finland. And again, what they're trying to do in a diplomatic context is to think about working together to sort of solve their, their common challenges. It was interesting to me as I noticed as I left directly across the street was the Syrian embassy that was shuttered and covered in graffiti. So these open collaborative models, we're seeing in politics, we're seeing them in business, but we're also seeing them in pretty interesting ways. This is Maria Ziv, she's the director of the Swedish Tourism Bureau, and she does her own research, and she did research around the world, and she said, let's find out from people, what do people think about Sweden? And the top two things that came back about Sweden were blonde people and ABBA. Kind of a challenge if you're the director of tourism because there's everything there is to know about Sweden. I don't need to go visit. Well, you know what she decided? She went to the government. If you guys are on Twitter, follow at Sweden. It's a tremendous social experiment. She gave up, basically the government gave over the Twitter account, the national Twitter account, to one Swedish citizen to tweet on behalf of the entire country. And it's still going on today to get that really sort of unvarnished look at what's happening. Kohei Fukazaki, incredible young man, he was struck by what happened with the earthquakes and the tsunami uh, two years ago in Japan. The difference with this young guy is that he could write code, and he created an Airbnb to basically help displaced citizens find housing with other people that had extra rooms to share. He moved 12,000 Japanese families around in three weeks. So guys, this is what's happening, this is the power. All this stuff is bubbling up from underneath and it's creating a far more organic and fast-moving way of leading. And it's democratic and open to far more people than it has been in the past. And then lastly, Sylvia Lali. So Sylvia Lali runs the Women's House in Lima, Peru. And she's an incredible example of creativity because she was fighting domestic abuse against women. And the challenge in Peru is that the police had turned a blind eye toward the problem far in part because the police force at the time was all male. So she told me she got really ticked off and decided to create her own private all women's police force. Guess what happened? They were so competent that legislature integrated them with the men and corruption dropped by 32%. <laughs> the point here is this incredible lateral creativity that comes by putting your whole self into challenges, by not conforming to the traditional sort of ways that things are. And that's really what we saw. We saw this ascendancy of these feminine values that we really believe are the operating system of the 21st century. They're going to create a far more sort of exciting platform as we start to think about problem solving in the future.